without further ado, we can go ahead and get started. We have four great presentations. And um, uh, I'll ask, uh, let's see. Oh, Anya, do you want to come up first? No? OK, you don't have okay. to come up first. That's fine. OK. OK. Our first presenter um, will be the great Anya Pearson Royce, who will be presenting Expressive Lives of Elders, edited by John Kay. Do you want the microphone? I'm sure they probably appreciate it. Can we try it without the mic? Is that OK? <coughs> Is it all right? Brandon Great. Says yes. I had a bad experience teaching in this room a long time ago, so I had to do it with the mic. And the absence of a lecture. So I'm going to stand <laughs> over here if you don't mind. I couldn't be happier to talk about this wonderful book by John Kay. I brought it in case you don't have a copy of it yet. Uh, Expressive Lives of Elders, Folklore, Art, and Aging came out in 2018. I'm going to start by quoting from John. I was reading the introductory chapter of this popped out at me. Traditional arts and other forms of folklore are not silver bullets for health and wellness in later life. Far from it. Rather, they are points of light that older adults can draw upon as they negotiate a new identity and satisfaction with their lives. It's a beautiful way talking about what this book is about. They create new identities for themselves that build on foundations of who they have been by remembering events and stories from a long lifetime. Memories and traditions come to life through their teaching and their mentoring. They create through the senses and sensual knowledge, ecologies of sensibility, which is a wonderful way of framing that, um, that are often more reliable and certainly more complex than, than abstract and formal kinds of knowledge that we usually credit for what we know. The wisdom in this collection is a significant departure from the way that we have thought about aging and the lives that our elders live. As John Kay points out, those lives are often built around the arts and tradition. Practicing them, and even more importantly, teaching and sharing them with others brings recognition to those who are often forgotten. This book, The Expressive Lives of Elders, Folklore, Art, and Aging, offers vivid ethnographic studies ranging across arts, traditions, and creative activities. So I'm not going to name them all, but quilting, weaving, wood carving, healing, gardening, and canon but that also explore the intergenerational connections that are nurtured by ecologies of seasons and cycles of sensibilities. And that more directly in part two, folk life and creative aging programs suggest the bases for initiatives that help us create satisfying lives for an increasing aging population. So who is John Kay? John Kay has a, has a distinguished um, CV. From 2004 to now, he's been the director of traditional arts Indiana through the Mathers Museum of World Cultures. And in fact, that's where I first met John when the uh, Graver's, Vic Graver's Basket exhibit was opened. And I met her and fell in love with her. And then I met you and I thought, you must be wonderful to have, to have made this happen. He's a professor of practice in the Department of Folklore and Ethnomusicology here, um, curator of folk life and cultural heritage at the Mathers Museum of World Cultures, where he's an indispensable help for whatever you might need. And previously, and this is important, he held appointments as the festival director and park services specialist in the Florida Folk Life Folk Festival in White Springs, Florida. And he's been the folklorist and park services specialist there from 1998 until 2004. And he's been responsible for a number of these 
wonderful collections um, and single authored books that have moved our knowledge really quantum leaps ahead in terms of what we know and think about um, the elderly. Now, as John tells the story, it was his seven years working as a folklorist in the Stephen Foster Folk Culture Center that let him see how people were able to use lifetimes of traditional knowledge to make satisfying lives for themselves and for those around them in their later years. The annual Folk Life Festival featured local traditions, gave older and often retired residents the opportunity to demonstrate to a wide audience the traditional arts that they had practiced for most of their lives, as well as sharing their stories with appreciative audiences. His long involvement in the field, and the field is a, is a big category for John, uh, and can take him almost everywhere, and the amazing network that he has created across academic and public institutions allowed him to bring together a diversity of voices and experiences that make this such a powerful book. One of the great joys of this book is hearing the stories of these older adults as they tell them. They speak their minds without apology or circumlocution. They speak eloquently and firmly in their own voices. Their voices are heightened by the splendid color photographs of them and of their work. That we hear their wise reflections so clearly is owed to the ability of the listeners, the field workers, to recognize that they themselves are only the medium through whom the stories flow. They're the backstage help, not the performers. So the book, the book poses the important question of whether the tr traditional arts and activities can make a positive difference in the older adults quality of life and how we might accomplish that. Second, it asks, it asks what the relationship is between these activities and people's backgrounds. What happens, for example, is, is, is raised in one chapter in the case of displacement, when people are removed from their traditional backgrounds. Uh, what difference does it make if older adults, adults engage in a craft or an art that's not traditionally their own? The contributors to the volume argue for programs that are based on the histories and experiences of the people who, who participate in them, and their examinations of traditional arts and folklore in the lives of older adults. They provide evidence that those activities do, in fact, contribute to an overall sense of well-being. So where does this fit? Well, folklore and anthropology have had close ties with elders. If we're honest, more often than not, it's the older members of communities who put up with us, who have, have the longest perspective on matters of community and traditional values, and who have the time and the desire to share that with us. The value of those voices has not always been singled out for credit. Barbara Meyerhoff changed this with her book and film number, Our Days. Um, and inspired work both academic and public through the 1980s and the 1990s. Her caution to us was that it was as much the psychological work of cultural activities as the activities themselves that mattered. Barbara K.G. took up the challenge, becoming one of the most important scholars working in this area. As John points out, it was the work of Alan Jabor to whom this volume is dedicated. That, the, that shifted the focus to a more applied folklore approach, and it's been going strong ever since that. Uh, John's introduction provides a thorough and a thoughtful positioning of work on aging by public organizations in the arts and humanities and the work of scholars in academic institutions. And this is another one of the strengths of this book, that it brings together the public and the academy. And as such, it gives us the grounding for understanding current work, and more importantly, offers signposts to where we might go. Chapter one, Lisa Higgins, <coughs> Boot Lasts and Bucket Lists, Joe Patricket, 
Tricus's Customized Art and Life. I wish I'd written that chapter or that title. Mm -hmm. Brings to, together the story of a fifth generation Western bootmaker with a careful survey of studies of aging and programs of public agencies. Her chapter is important too because this person took up Western bootmaking as a second career when it became clear that all the members of his family who had done this were dying or dead. It's a concrete example of one of the many ways in which older practitioners come to their work. <clears throat> in the next case studies, uh, the book tackles some of the persistent stereotypes <coughs> of the aging population, held by the community at large and unfortunately by many of the agencies that are assigned to deal with aging. They illustrate the ways in which people's lives contradict those labels. Christensen in her chapter Still Working, which is a wonderful example of speaking your mind, um, provides an example that opens up new paths of understanding. In her focus on gardening and home food preservation, she argues that these activities keep up networks of work and exchange. They illustrate expertise and aesthetic taste, and they keep people mentally and physically active and demonstrate productive and relevant lives. In a similar way, Lockwood talks about a Finnish weaver, Anna Lasala, Lasila. And we can see her transition from being regarded and regarding herself as producing common, ordinary, but necessary things in the household to being someone who was seen as an important conveyor of tradition in producing things that could be hung in museums. <clears throat> Her self-description, I don't have time to be bored, tells an important story. We see a similar sense of self-awareness in the story of Hivaro Carver, Don Jose, in Carrillo's chapter, Field Worker in the Cane. In a reflection, Don Jose says that his life story in his life story, there are no heroic deeds or people with grand titles. And then he goes on to talk about the important whole tradition and culture. He learned from them values that guided his life. Quote, in particular, love for work, respect for people, honesty, fidelity to what is promised, sharing what one has with those who have the greatest needs, respect for nature and attachment to family. And when you look at his carvings, you can see all of those values reflected uh, in his awareness of that, the importance of that tradition. And there's a chapter by Morales on the healer, Jerusalem. At 86, she feels needed. She was feeling that maybe her art was not valued anymore. And then Hurricane Maria happened, caused not only physical destruction, but psychic as well. And people came to her, called her up for healing. So she says, my life is beautiful because there are other people who need me. I can keep teaching and learning. Sometimes one word can change your life forever. Other chapters offer examples of resilience when age or infirmity means that one has to adapt to new ways of being creative. And John provides that wonderful example of quilter Nancy Morgan, whose increasing arthritis made it impossible for her to, uh, to continue quilting and engaging in the quilting party. So she went back to another tradition in her youth, um, briar stitching, and began embroidering flowers and birds onto random pieced fabric, making wall hangings and presents for other people. Another path that John talks about, and others in the, in the book talk about, is continued creativity and connections with one's craft by teaching it. Atkinson's chapter expands the traditional notion of passing tradition on to a new generation by providing examples of teaching to the same generation or people who are even older than the person who's practicing the craft. She draws interesting examples from Japan from a uh, Japanese American, Hawaiian American who teaches um, traditional Japanese dance to women at a senior center, or Hawaiian um, 
expert Charles Herring, who teaches basket making, basket weaving, and feather working to apprentices who are 20 or 30 years younger than he is. <clears throat> Atkinson's also raises the really important issue of dislocation, that is being separated from those traditions and cultures that you grew up with or that you were familiar with. Um, this is an important dimension, Atkinson suggests, for people who are working in refugee settlement or other immigrant communities and should be kept in mind for agencies that are offering grants. The last chapter has this wonderful title, Dancing Chairs and Mythic Trees. It's by Troy Geist, and it connects us to other disciplines that focus on the elderly. Geist also proposes the importance of maintaining a strong and extensive repertory of the senses, making sure that the five senses are activated. These are often underused in those contexts in which the population is older people. Um, because we tend to think that, that along with getting older, you sort of lose track of all those senses that are important to leading an active life. Um, I'm going to mention two examples from the world of dance that have had major impact on quality of life for old people. Mark Morris, famous choreographer, um, uh, created a program of dance classes for people with Parkinson's disease. And they're offered now all across the country, and they've had significant positive effects on the mobility and the active life of those people. A shorter term project, but an interesting one, was that of Bill T. Jones, uh, creator of the Bill T. Jones and Arnie Zane Dance Company. He was interested in um, doing a piece about um, people who are coming to grips with terminal illnesses, and so he put the word out and offered um, workshops for people who wanted to come and talk about that. And uh, they talked about it, but more importantly, they danced it. So he had them move in a way that spoke to how they felt about having a terminal illness. And uh, he made a wonderful piece about it called Still Life. Um, so the people came to the workshops, they talked, they moved, and they listened to each other's stories, and they went away with better ways of confronting the future. So we tend to begin restricting our participation in fully sensory ways as we age, above all in those places where our older citizens reside. And everything we know tells us that it makes no sense or nonsense as a policy. This is a book filled with powerful stories and lessons learned over long lives. If we ignore or dismiss them, we learn, lose the opportunity to learn from knowledge, resilience, self-reflection, and creativity accumulated over <coughs> lifetimes. We lose the opportunity to collaborate with these storytellers to build programs that honor and enhance their lives. They give us a firm foundation, or as John writes, roadmaps for the future. The contributors also contribute to making these roadmaps by outlining what we can learn from previous and contemporary thinking. In this book, John is built on the work that he highlighted in two previous books, Folklore and the Expressive Lives of Elders and Folk Art and Aging, Life Story, Objects and Their Makers. So he has moved the field ahead in quantum leaps. This is a work made possible by the collective visioning and the support of the series Material Vernaculars, whose editor is our colleague, Jason Jackson, by Traditional Arts Indiana at the Mathers Museum, by Indiana University Press and its director, Gary Dunham, certainly by the 11 contributors, and even more importantly, by the many elders who continue to teach us. In the end, it's a work that would not have happened <clears throat> without our colleague, John Kay. He has a significant trajectory built on public involvement, careful listening, casting the widest of nets, or as my favorite philosopher, dancers, argue, saying yes to everything. 
and making a place for everyone who wants to be part of this journey. Thank you, John. presenter is going to be our own uh, Dr. Brandon Barker, uh, who's going to be presenting Greg Schrimm's book, The Science of Mesh and Vice Versa. Brandon, do you want to use the microphone? Uh, I think I'm not going to use the microphone. And I hope I have enough time, I meant to put a clock, okay, 426, to say a little bit about what the scientists that I work with think about Greg's work, because they love Greg's work, too. <clears throat> and so this is a, I'm really honored, you know what I mean? I'm kind of excited, I'm almost a little nervous, because this means a lot to me, because the book uh, is really great, and Greg's work is really great. Some people put science on a pedestal. <clears throat> As evidence, I might mention the proliferation of STEM initiatives or the skewed fiscal reality that, if my math is correct, one year of annual funding of the NSF, just about $7 billion, could fund the NEA at its current annual budget allocation, $152 million for nearly 50 years. <laughs> it could fund the poorer NEH, $42 million, for more than 150 years. A century and a half may not be quite long enough to consider on a mythological time scale, but it's plenty long enough to think in terms of history. I looked a couple of these things up. 150 years ago, Ulysses S. Grant was president. Wyoming gave the right to women to vote. The Cincinnati Red Stockings became the first professional baseball team in America. Toy models of time aside, maybe the reasons for a lack of balance are obvious, I mean. As in science, eradicated smallpox, nearly eliminated polio. Speaking of the cosmos, weren't scientists responsible for getting our species to the moon, for making it to Mars? Who mapped the genome, discovered the W and Z boson particles? Who proved that crows are smarter than your seven-year-old child? <laughs> scientists. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. You're thinking, I'm leaving some things out. I mean. Aren't scientists probably also to blame for splitting the atom, for carbon emissions? Aren't they somehow responsible for the iPhones and the face space? <laughs> <laughs> and you're right. It turns out that science may not be great at isolating, articulating, or promoting values. Even if facts do not lend themselves easily to relativistic thinking, value most certainly does. As the great gestaltist Wolfgang Kurler asked, so do we. What is the place of value? in a world of scientific facts. Of course, I cannot look around this room and place blame for a current sense of scientific entitlement. Obviously, 19th and 20th century turns toward cultural relativism, ethnography, and performance turned away from scientific universalism just as they turned away from philosophical positivism. I like to say that folklores are hardcore relativists. <laughs> Guilt-free though we all may be, it is Greg Shrimp whose writings never stop affecting the way that I think about science because he puts his money precisely where his mouth is. Like previous works, ancient mythology of modern science and science bred in circuses, the science of myth and vice versa. I forgot a darn copy in the office and it's a shame because I've got a moment where I'm gonna need it as a prop. I'll have to mind it. <clears throat> the science of myth and vice versa published as a subsidiary by a subsidiary of the University of Chicago's press, aptly called Prickly Paradigm Press, hits the nail on the head. Myth and science are equally important concepts. Greg tells his readers this immediately. Adding only, myth and science are also e equally fuzzy concepts. This is Greg. For all that we now find problematic in Fraser's attitudes towards myth and science, he was wise in not drawing an absolute line between them. So it is with a wink and perhaps a bit of strong conviction that Greg starts his speedy, punchy book, featuring four essays on the blending of myth and science that arise when scientific thinkers attempt to communicate normative values. First up, Malcolm Gladwell's science-based reading, The Biblical Narrative, David and Goliath. 
While the most common pre-Gladwellian reading of the narrative hinges upon the interpretation of David's defeat of Philistine's great giant warrior as evidence of the power of courage propelled by steadfast faith in the Lord, Gladwell, not satisfied with this reading, wants a new one. And he regales his readers instead with a three-part scientific argument for why, in the context of scientific fact, we should not be surprised to know that David beat the giant. These three parts are, A, ballistic analysis of the stone's speed, of the local stone's relative densities, their barium sulfate. B, the pathology, apromegaly, which is a pituitary condition that causes Goliath's gigantism. It also causes bad vision, relative immobility. Number three, C, statistical analyses of historical warfare, showing that smaller unconventional guerrilla forces win <clears throat> approximately 64% of the time. Now, I know some of us need think no further than Wesley as Dread Pirate Roberts take down a pheasant to muffle the sounds of Gladwell's mic drop. And Greg happily reminds us that as a traditional narrative, David and Goliath could easily have as much to do with the tortoise and the hare or the lion and the mouse as it does with materialists' understanding of ballistic technology. <clears throat> On the topic of traditional narrative, Greg concludes his takedown of Gladwell, that's what it is, with a not so veiled critique. Statistically, a courageous and devout small combatant, favored by the Lord and armed with superior ballistic and unconventional strategy, will overcome a large combatant impaired by a brain tumor. It's a little awkward. And then Greg says, sometimes it's just better to stick with one version or the other. In the context of aesthetics, accusing the pre-Gladwellian and the Gladwellian readings leads Greg to a post-Gladwellian meh. The essay is a good start. Next up, the great new historicist himself, Stephen Greenblatt, and the return of the return of Lucretius. For me, it's always been compelling that the new historicists often refer to their preference for anecdotal evidence as a Geertsian touch of the real, an idea I should think many folklorists find appealing. But after reading Greg's take on Greenblatt's The Swerve, I find myself rephrasing that to something like just a little tiny, just the tiniest atomic smidgen of the real. Greenblatt's historical anecdote in The Swerve concerns the unlikely rediscovery of Lucretius de Rerum Natura, which was written in the first century BC, by the 15th century book hunter Poggio Bracleone. So, and I want to make sure I get this right. It is beginning with Epicurean philosophy into Lucretius' poem through Bracleone's rediscovery of Lucretius, and now finally Greenblatt's presentation and his new historicist argument that we once again foreground atomic materialism. Lucretius had argued that Epicurean philosophy changed history forever. Lucretius was writing in about, uh, Epicurus was writing in about 341 to 270 BC. Greenblatt comes to argue similarly in the swerve that Bracleone's rediscovery of Lucretius changed the world forever as it became a catalyst for the Renaissance. I know you see it coming. It doesn't take long for Greg to point to the antiquated mythic heroes and hero heralds embedded in the new historicist bestseller. An Epicurean update, Greenblatt's hero story brings us, Greg explains, to the edge of Malinowski and Mythos Charter, to the rise of the American pursuit of happiness. I think this, a dear friend once taught me that good poetry is almost always about poetry and whatever else it's about. With its skeptical stance, good science must also always be about science and whatever else it's about. Greg shows us that good, read best-selling, histories, especially new histories, that cast an anti-mythological rhetoric by alluding to the power of atomic materialism must always be about myth and whatever else they are about. Maybe we could call it a touch of the mythic. The third part in Greg's four-point argument. We arrive at a subject no less grand than the entirety of the cosmos. Greg's topic is Neil deGrasse Tyson's recent slick remake of Carl Sagan's famous documentary television series, Cosmos. 
Sagan's version aired in 1980, you may recall, Tyson's in 2014. Now, the first lesson in this essay is that we are, in fact, talking about not one, but two cosmos. Cosmos one, as Greg labels it, is, historically speaking, older in that it is comprised of the traditional, traditionalized, humanizable part of the universe. Cosmos two, kind of new, is comprised of the scientifically understood totality of the physical universe. Upon parsing out these two universes, Greg sets off to recast Tyson's remake as little more than an update of the popular cultural representations of Cosmos II. Fancy new CGI makes for more beautiful series, we suppose, but there has been no scientific paradigm shift since 1980 that necessitates updating Sagan's series. Greg quips that while the shelf life of Cosmos II might be infinity, the shelf life of Cosmos I is just about three decades. In this case, the scientist, popular scientist, charged with communicating value to those who remain naive to a scientific description of the universe, beguiles his audience, directing attention to Cosmos 2, while actually talking, talking mostly about Cosmos 1. It is like a sleight of hand that my friends and neuroscientists, Susanna martinez Cohn and Steve McMagnick, who work ethnographically with stage magicians, call a sleight of mind. On analogy, the magician looks to the sky, drawing attention to the hand there, opens it, it's empty, because of course the magician knew that the coin had never been in the hand at all. Greg's piece, though, prompts a slightly different line of inquiry than that prompted by Susanna and Steve's work magicians. We are left wondering, how aware are the scientists that they have tricks up their sleeve, mythological tricks up their sleeve? The fourth and final piece. <clears throat> the ultimate essay is titled, Ron Cooked Redux. Greg analyzes, in the context of Linda Strauss, <clears throat> excuse me, real food, real food writer, Michael Pollan's Cooked, A Natural History of Transformation. As any good catfish could be on or tender confit, Greg takes his time analyzing the Redux by unpackaging several of Cook's connections to a range of mythic topics, including the analogous relationship of Levi Strauss's hot versus cold societies to modern notions of environmentally irresponsible versus sustainable societies, including also analyses of three other modern scientific fire myths, including also Levi, Levi Strauss's joining the likes of Propp and Campbell as mythologists whose <laughs> works have created their own modern mythologies. At this moment for me, I'm particularly taken with Greg's mapping of Levi Strauss's notion of Neolithic science, which he calls in science, versus modern science, which Greg calls M science, onto Poland's food argument. We can think of Neolithic science, in science, as the older science that is both closer to perceptual experience and imagination. In science is personified by the handyman or traditional local food waste expert. Modern science M science is newer. It is concerned with aspects of the physical world which we cannot perceive without the assistance of scientific technology. So it is removed from perception and imagination. M science is personified by the engineer. A core <coughs> argument in Poland's cooked is that overprocessed engineered foods such as industrial pork or Wonder Bread, though easily made available and cheap, are tragically bad for us. They lack flavor, they lack nutritional value, they lead to all kinds of poor to health problems. From this critique of processed foods, Poland seeks to value positively the older cuisines of the world, especially the communal, home-cooked meal. Already I'm sure you recognize some of the nuanced overlaps and disparities between Levi Strauss's in science and science and Poland's engineered food, slow food arguments. It's complicated. Greg is a careful thinker. And it's in clear and piercing prose that he articulates several of these similarities and differences. Here's one good example. Noting that Poland doesn't completely dismiss M science. This is kind of also complicated, but we could say, after all, for example, Poland leans heavily on the bioevolutionary evidence and argument of Richard Wrangham, who proposed the advent of cooking, that is cooking by the way of fire, broke down food before our ancestors ate it so that we were able to trade a big gut for a big brain. 
Greg says this about the place of myth in a world of M science facts. This is a quote. What happens to archaic myths, those that arose from in science and the world of M science? Archaic mythologies, shorn of religious and or ritual context, are repurposed as sources of psychological and sociological insight and as backup support for M science claims, whether in the form of convergent findings, useful metaphors, or just a bit of added poetic flair. Like some good new historian did, let me close with an anecdote. As I was reading, rereading actually, Greg's book for this little talk, uh, I was sitting on the couch and I had it open to this very argument in the final uh, chapter. And I was reading, and you see, I've got some eczema going here on my arm. It's true. I roll my sleeves up, see? <laughs> see? As I was reading, my four year old daughter, her name is Zoe, had uh, meandering around, getting into everything as she always does, put on a pair of her mother's sunglasses. And she walked up to me, she had seen me scratching vigorously during the day. I, got some, I need to stop, okay? And I'm reading this chapter and she says, Dad, Dad, let me see your bobo, let me see your bobo. And then, looking at my bobo through <clears throat> the lens that she's wearing, she informed me that I have bumps. The lens helped her see them, and she knew the cure. The cure was a little unfortunate in that it meant that she was taking the broom, the same broom that we used to sweep the floors with, and rubbing it all over my <laughs> arm. <clears throat> so, well, I can't say that my eczema has been healed. But the experience did remind me once again of the importance of the powerful thinking that results from close attention to patterns of mind. Greg's book, like all of his work on science, moved me wistfully from the mytho-scientific to topics including developmental evidence for the acquisition of M-science worldviews to a place, to, to this question, what is the place of Doc McStuffins in a world of child lore? I think that's where she got that. Mm -hmm. Call it myth, call it science, whatever. No aspect of mind or culture is trivial. Isn't this a key folkloristic argument? The science of myth and vice versa is not large, it is not expensive, it is excellent. So maybe a little bit like some 17th century psalm book or primer, I'll carry it around in my pocket, pull it out when I need to raise my spirits or when I need to remind myself of what's at stake in the work that folklorists and mythologists do. So as a final comment to what my friend and Greg's friend, Danny Povinelli said, Whenever he first read this book, Danny Povinelli is kind of known as a hardcore skeptical scientist amongst comparative psychologists. And I sent Danny a copy of this, I think pretty much as soon as it was published. And the only, he sent me a one-word response, appropriately mythological, and it was, Amen. So <laughs> congratulations, Greg, on a great book. Protest, Intervention, and Reflection, which was also co-edited by one of our esteemed alumni in this program, Dr. Stephanie Schoenick. So what's happening, everybody? excited about it, you fake the enthusiasm <laughs> so that the person can move on with what they got to do. So what's happening, everybody? What's what's happening? Happening? Thank you. <laughs> so let me begin by saying how uh, happy I am to be here today. First time I've kind of had this interaction with, this type of interaction with the Department of uh, Folklore and Ethnomusicology. I know lots of folks in that department and I have known them for years and have enjoyed all my collegial interactions with them. So thank you for, for giving me this opportunity to, to talk. Um, as you probably know, I am the person who's going to make comments on the book Black Lives Matter Music, 
a volume edited by uh, Fernando, and from, I hope I don't murder your name, Orojuela, okay, and Stephanie Shonica. Um Also, there, I know, I, I know Fernando and I know Stephanie. I taught Allie and I taught Langston. So, um, it's the book is the authors are close to me in the sense that I'm, I was excited to see this work and it made me feel really good to be asked to, to talk about it. So the, uh, the lines that follow the column are protest, intervention, and reflection. And I kind of want to park there a little bit in, as I talk about the book as a way of saying that um, social movements, uh, So social movements within black traditions are not new. Protests has been happening in spaces where blacks were <coughs> and are long before the Atlanta slave trade. At the heart of black protests and resistance is black people rejection of domination and intimidation <coughs> and being dehumanized and otherwise in ways that gave their lives no value. It's within this context that I place Black Lives Matter and music, both the experience and this very, very good book. This is a book that discusses a continuous long journey in which Blacks have engaged in order to achieve freedom, justice, and equality. That journey has been critiqued as systems has been critiqued because of its relationship to systems of, of supremacists and domination, as well as its ability to articulate a narrative about black people in the African American community that has been largely false. So this book is useful in helping us understand both the importance of re-narrating rearticulating and reassessing who black people are through the lens of black people as black people move themselves from objects to subjects of their own experience. And black study, we call that Africana studies. When we're able to take the experiences of black people, locate them epistemologically in their own spaces, articulate their ideas and their experiences through their voices, through their culture, through their, through their experiences, humanize them along the way as part of a way of moving them from white gaze and imagination to black articulation. And so this is what this book offers to us. It offers us the opportunity to intersect what I think Fernando calls black folk study. I like that term. I think you said that. Am I making that out? Okay. <laughs> black folk studies and Africana study with ethnomusicological approaches at the core of the way in which this work is, is being done. In this book, Black Lives Matter and Music, um, the writer help us rethink ways we can theorize the otherizing of, of black people. It is done through five chapters written by Stephanie, Fernando, Langston, Ali, and Denise. What's interesting about these various perspectives is how these particular authors collectively help us understand how black people make their lives matter in places where their lives are not being given appropriate attention. As you know, in 2013, Black Lives Matter phrase create a, a, an uproar in America, so much so that it made some people feel like the expression itself was rejecting the idea that other people don't matter. Only people who have not been oppressed take that kind of position. Because if you have not been oppressed as a group, then you probably know that your life matter, right? Because everything in the damn world revolves around you. <laughs> so to say that it's nothing but a distraction away from the issue that is being proposed in terms of trying to understand the experiences of a group that's been otherized and has been marginalized in society.
But the thing about this text is that it helps us understand in another kind of way how music function as not only a, 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 an approach to dealing with being marginalized and otherwise, but also how it can also be a healing space that empowers people to make their lives important, that give people the capacity to rearticulate and re-narrate what has happened to them and also what they're doing about it. It gives them the opportunity and the capacity to talk about agency in a different kind of way. Within this context, when you read Stephanie's uh, chapter that deals with Mizzou and looking at uh, the students' response to being racialized on the campus and the lack of, the, lack of response, appropriate response from the administration in addressing those issues, um, Stephanie helped us understand how faculty and students came together with the School of Music to create a music project that spoke to that need. So on the one hand, music is, is expressive in the way that it is allowing the groups of people to talk about what is going on. And on the other hand, the very people engaged in the project are also experiencing forms of liberation because they've come together to attack an issue, address an issue that is, that is oppressive. So that campus itself became sort of a, a space where music set itself down and began to articulate and express at the same time, began to critique and inform at the same time, began to resist and empower at the same time. In the black church, we say, preach, preacher. <laughs> just, I don't, the folklore is kind of like, like that kind of kind of stuff. <laughs> like a change. Anyway. So what Stephanie does in this piece is help us understand how music, when appropriately used, can really be a galvanizing force to do good. Fernando's conversation takes us into the classroom, where he uses the classroom as a community space. He solicits opinions and ideas from students about issues of race and other kinds of points of views. I think what he found in this space is that in, 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 in certain environments, students can be diverse in what they think, but they also can be rather conservative in the expression of those ideas. But what becomes very important about pedagogy is that it exists to help us to, to not make judgment, but to make evaluations. And I think the way in which Fernando uses music and his ethnomusicological and folklore training in this context opens the door for, for students to find themselves in the dialogue, in the conversation. Sometimes music is useful and very helpful in helping us do that. That's why the hip hop culture is so powerful. It's a space where people can sit themselves down and, and find their way forward in terms of issues that are being discussed. In this particular piece Fernando wrote, one can understand the relationship between what Black Lives Matter movement attempted, attempts to do and what he's attempting to do in the classroom, which, which is to create capacity to exist and coexist in ways that allows communities of people to move forward together without harming each other, without destroying um, each other. Through communications and conversation, they're able to empower each other by thinking differently about who they are in the remaking of that meaning and of that message. That's the purpose of music to some degree. It offers us the opportunity to remake and to create new meanings about life and, and situation. Langston then provides what I call a very good case study of this way of thinking about culture and music and the remaking of oneself. One of the things that the Black Lives Matter movement is asking America to do is to remake itself, to remake itself in a way that, that, is, that allows inclusiveness and differences not to be seen as deficit, but to be seen as substantive strength within the American community that, that opens up the capacity for the country to really achieve all of its objectives in terms of what its initial republic creed was, that is, we all are 
an equal in, in this society. But in Houston, we find per lengths of discussion a situation where a community of people um, are not experiencing uh, the American uh, dream, where discrimination and poverty and drugs and crime are dominating uh, the space and where it's very difficult was very difficult for people to express um, themselves in ways where they feel valued. So they created a culture that I absolutely had not ever heard because I'm not a car person. They created a culture called slab. And slab is about custom, re recustomizing cars in a particular kind of way that say something about your identity, right? Not about your class and power, it's more about identity. And if you know what this looks like, it's these big rims and the rim got cones on them and then uh, from there I know nothing about slabs. <laughs> I know it's about, it's about how the, how, how the, um, the refashioning of these cars provides a space for people to refashion themselves, to remake themselves in their own image, so that when the world sees them negatively, what they created for themselves and what they sit in and ride is allows them to see themselves as their own creator. And by doing so, they're able to rearticulate who they are as men, who they are as a community of people. What Langston thought was uh, good about this is that the capacity that is created in that kind of culture space allows people who are looking for ways to rearticulate and to critique and people who don't have a lot of money is at, 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 at times to be valued. So this is a way that, that they created value for themselves and value of the spaces where they were. Um, Langston does this by building collaboration between sort of active activists, uh, artists, and scholars like, him, like himself. And the usefulness of that intersection of, of people makes it possible for rearticulation re uh, to happen in spaces that have been largely defined as deserts. And we know that in big urban spaces where there are large groups of people of color, we so easily marginalize and see people as desert folks. So Ali, um, go-go music. Um, I, I, I love this idea. I, I, I love to dance. And so uh, dancing the go-go one time was one thing that I thought was really cool. I don't know if I think that now, but one time I did. <laughs> and so, but the idea about this go-go music is that in a space, like in the club, in a disco place, in a designated space, um, dancing go-go was as much a music art form as much, as much as it was a form of resistance. It was a kind of dance and a kind of music and a kind of style that was not mainstream, that was not seen as sort of high culture. But within that space, go-go allowed people to define for themselves their own culture and their own expression um, of themselves, that it was, they were able to use go-go music at, in a political kind of way to push back against like gentrification and other things that are happening in the Washington DC area that were in position to, to, to poor people at, uh, in, in DC during, during this current moment. So go-go became a way that music allowed people to build community around, around power and around their own sense of self and created for them an expression that articulated um, um, voices against structural racism and structural domination, including the way in which the community was being policed um, during this time period. So lastly, there's a piece written by Denise and it's about Detroit, which is typically thought of black capital of the world. This is where um, techno music and electronic music and sound all come together to, to, to produce a space in the Detroit music scene away from mainstream America where people are able to create 
uh, businesses for themselves in many different kinds of ways to, to feed themselves and to take care of their family. What's interesting about this particular approach that is happening in Detroit is that um, these, those involved in the techno and electronic music really realize that in order to survive, creativity and imagination is what pushed the re-narration. That if there's going to be a re-articulation, a re-narration of black life, it has to come from an imagined place. That black people have to see themselves a lot differently than what society has, how society has constructed them. They have to believe differently in themselves um, in ways that, that, that indicate their own value and indicate their worth. What this book helps us understand is that protests, intervention, and reflections have their appropriate places in the discourses and in the strategies of survival for, for black people. But for me, it, 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 the Black Lives Matter and music tech raised one, one big question for me. Um, made many questions for me, but the biggest question for me has to do with how do you, how do you translate it, right? So if, you, if, you, if you're in the classroom, you're on the college campus. Uh, food and drink will be provided, and we look forward to seeing you there, where you'll have the opportunity to engage with these authors. down, but I'm happy I'm here. <laughs> and my pleasure is to talk about Steve Stumpley's book called Port of Spain. That's the capital city of Trinidad. That I didn't even know before I started this, but <laughs> here I am. What's important to note at the very beginning is that the reason that Steve came to Trinidad was music. In spending time in Trinidad, he wrote a really wonderful book on the steel, steel band movement, a really terrific book in ethnomusicology. More important than that, he met and married Denise. That, <laughs> and that caused him, as a consequence of that, to actually spend a lot of time in Port of Spain and to get to know Denise's city, her city, instead of his city. His city is Gettysburg, think of that. <laughs> to get to know a, her city, Port of Spain. He begins Steel Band by talking about the landscape of Port of Spain. So that he was set up already to spend a long time to write a major book on the city, Port of Spain. Steve isn't just telling a history. That needs to be stressed at the very beginning. We've got a lot of kind of histories in the world, but this is a, a history is always exclusive. It's always based on time. And time is a kind of an arrogant dimension. Space is a much broader and more democratic, more inclusive dimension. Everybody lives in space, not everybody lives in time. And so that Steve, writing about Port of Spain, isn't telling a historian's story, he's telling a cultural geographer's story. It's tremendously important. He's turning away from mere time towards the important inclusive dimension of space. He's writing a cultural geography book. That's an opportunity for me and us together to acknowledge the, to acknowledge the tremendous importance of the dis discipline of geography in folkloristic study. We don't think that way. We always pretty well reduce it to a couple of oppositions. But geography is tremendously important in our discipline. For example, in the very beginning, the very beginning of the idea of folklore in the United States, Franz Boas, coupled with Francis James Child, in propelling the discipline professionally forward. Child was a literary scholar. What's important here, Boas was a geographer. There wasn't anthropology yet. Rather, he was born into the discipline of geography. And then during field work, early field work that he did among the Central Escobo and the great field work he did among the Quaquetl, Boaz shifted slowly from the ecological, reminding you immediately that we've got a century and a half of ecological study within these disciplines. There's nothing new about it at all. 
He moved from the ecological, from the spatial, slowly through an attention to social organization, and from social organization he found the conclusion in art, in creativity. The ultimate definition of the human being is that we're all creative, and if you want to understand us, you better understand our creativity. That's exactly what Boaz did. He did it in ceremonials. He did it in myths. He did it in sculpture. Well, that movement from space to society to art is exactly what Steve Stumpley accomplishes in this book. It begins with a particular space, a location. That location is a city, Port of Spain, that has a harbor on the west. It has hills rippling away on the east. You get this kind of sense of a kind of a dichotomy spatially right from the very beginning. That there's water over here and hills over there and a city in between. He begins with that space and then he moves socially. And what you have to acknowledge is a tremendous complexity of the social world that Steve enters. A world of people of African descent and European descent and Indian descent. All of them differently configured by the cross currents of class. And then at the end of it, what Steve finds, just as Boaz found, is art. He finds carnival costume, he finds steel band music, he finds calypso song. All of those things at the end, and if you were, had a, in front of you a historian's book, you'd be surprised for those things to even be introduced into the book at all. But if you've got a geographer's book, you've got a folklorist's book, if you've got an ethnomusicologist's book, if you didn't have art at the end of the story, you wouldn't have human beings recognizable in their creative force. You wouldn't find the power of those people at all until you've gotten to art. And so that Steve spends a lot more time than you would think you would find in a history book on the capital city of a place in the world of art. In moving, that is, in moving precisely as Franz Boas did a long time ago, Steve Stumpley in moving from space to art follows exactly in the Boasian framework. What Boas did was in that motion invent American anthropology, which is not like the anthropology of other places. What Boas did is he established an inclination within the discipline of folklore towards the ethnographic towards the kinds of interests that Boaz had in space, in society, in art, preparing ultimately for, interestingly enough, a shift in folklore studies in the 1960s to something that was called folk life. You still find that term folk life stuck in Washington, D.C. You found it in the title of the University of Pennsylvania's folklore program. But what's important in the shift to folk life in the 1960s was the incorporation of three distinct schools of geography, every one of which has contributed tremendously, almost subliminally, to who we are as American folklorists. The first of those schools is the Aberystwyth School in the, on the coast of Wales, put together by a man called H.J. Fleur. And out of Aberystwyth flowed Eston Evans, Norworth Peak. As Evans became the first great exponent of folk life study in Ireland. Pete became the great exponent of folk life study in Wales. Both of them founded major museums. Both of them wrote magnificent general stories of folk life in Ireland and in Wales. And all of them contributed in a particular way to our understanding and Steve's understanding. But if you're going to do their kind of folk life study, you better att pay attention to poor people as well as rich people. That's a critique of history. It's a critique of history that comes right out of the historical studies that were developed by the great folk life scholars, and that you realize that history, stop and think, it's a, it's a story of rich folks. We could have a different story, because most of the world's people today, you know that the great majority of people in the world today are still living in rural places. The great majority of people are still farmers. The great majority of people are poor by our standards, probably not so poor by their own standards. That's just simply a fact. We, everything is urban now, and everything is sophisticated, and everybody owns a computer. Yeah, well, <laughs> there are more people without electricity in India than there are people in Europe and the United States put together. Think about that as a fact. So we, the whole point is to be reminded about the complexity of the world. That's what scholarship is about. One of the complexities that Steve does 
perfectly in line with the teaching of Evans and Pete, he pays a lot of attention to poor folks as well as rich folks. They also taught that you'd better pay attention if you're going to do any history. You better do more than change because change is always the power of the powerful. If you want to study the rest of the world, most of the people are not changing a whole lot. They're doing the best they could. They're getting through another damn day is what they're doing. And so what they don't do is they don't worry about big changes. They worry about a friend Daniel Johnson described it as survival. It's a rich way of life. You get to the next meal, you've succeeded. That's great. That's the way most people are living. And so that if you don't pay attention to those people <coughs> that are having a hard time, people that are poor, that if you don't pay attention to continuity as well as change, you just simply don't understand, Braudel teaches you, you just don't understand what history's about. History's got to be about continuity. Well, Steve Stumpfley does that. He talks about change, but he does talk about continuity. He talks about rich people, but he talks about poor people. The first of the schools of geography that we welcomed in in the 1960s in the discipline of folklore, the Aberystwyth School, <coughs> taught us to pay attention to the poor and taught us to pay attention to continuity. The second of those schools was W.G. Hoskins' English School of Geography, and Hoskins developed a geography that connected immediately to local history. Now, the professional historian thinks, in the United States, thinks that local history is kind of trivial history, not important at all. But the fact is, lo local history is where all history happens. There is no such thing as non-local history, it's all local. Not only is all local history local, but also local history is clearly the test of whether the big story you're being told is a lie or not. Does it work out here? If it doesn't work out here, something's wrong. So that, that local history idea offered to us by W.G. Hoskins is also key to what Steve did in this book. He's written a magnificent local history, a magnificent local history that I'm sure the people of Trinidad will receive with great gratitude. The third of the schools of geography that got in our way back in the 1960s was Carl Sowers. Sauer was a colleague of Probers at Berkeley, <coughs> and he trained a group of people that took, developed a particularly American version of geographic study. Fred Niffen, Don Meinig, Ifu Tuan, Wilbur Zielinski, Pierce Lewis. And what those people did was pay tremendous attention to place, thinking of place as more important than time. Places where everybody is anchored somewhere, everybody can count, count on some places being home, and it matters tremendously. And those great geographers offered to Steve Stumpfley the right, in a sense, to study Port of Spain as a place, as a particular place with its own particular character. And most of those geographers were interested in rural places. Think of Don Mining's fantastic observations on the county of Fife in Scotland. But Pierce Lewis wrote a great urban geography on the city of New Orleans. The city of New Orleans book by Pierce Lewis, among other things, completely and accurately into details predicted Katrina. Read that book, you would have known that thing was going to happen. Read that book and you'll know that what's the cause of the disaster? You think it was a storm? Read Pierce. It's racism that was the disaster. That was the cause of the terrible things that happened in New Orleans. It wasn't a storm. A storm would have been fine had it not been for the racist history of New Orleans that settled people in places that were vulnerable just because they were poor and just because they were black. So this is our friend Steve, and he read writes a book about Port of Spain, and the comparisons between Pierce Lewis's book on New Orleans and, the, and Steve's book are just fabulous. Just a constant set of comparisons. New Orleans is amazingly like Port of Spain. Port of Spain is amazingly like New Orleans. And late in his book, Steve actually compares Port of Spain to other Caribbean cities like Kingston. And he begins to think about these all fitting together. And I can tell you that take New Orleans, connect it to Port of Spain, sweep across the Caribbean, and follow over the top of South America from Cartagena to Salvador, and you've got an anatomy of the Creole city. Anatomy of the Creole city that couldn't be anything like it is were it not for the black presence. That's just powerful. Whole great 
urban tradition. It's not just marginal. We're not sneaking around the edges here. We're at the very dead center. Well, here's what Steve does in this book. These are the, this is the heritage that he has that I wanted to articulate because I think it's, we need to remember how important geographic thinking, Boaz, space, society, art. That sequence allows us to imagine everybody fits into that sequence. Here's what Steve does. He establishes a period. The period begins in 1888, 50 years after emancipation. It ends in 1962 at the beginning of independence. He divides that big pattern into three by inserting the both world wars. So you've got a sequence from 1888 to 1962 that breaks at the First World War, that breaks at the Second World War. You've got a kind of timeline for development. And one of the stories that Steve tells is a story, he uses the word aspiration, and I like it. It doesn't mean success, it means hope. And in that history of aspiration, there is a progress in city planning, there's progress in civic building, there's progress in domestic housing, all these things that sound uh, good. We're heading towards something better. During this time, there's a certain shift that occurs that's very interesting in Port of Spain that they started out with a kind of orientation to England. England took over uh, Trinidad in 1802, and so there'd been a long time of English presence that was there, was there in Trinidad. And now we sort of shift our attention from England to the United States to begin with because of movies, American films that took American ideas down there. And then with the Second World War, there were a whole lot of American military personnel, largely loud, largely racist, largely a mess, but nonetheless, <laughs> heading off all towards a connection to the United States. So that's the developmental story. I don't want to put it down, I want to put it forward, but it's a, it's a background. There's a kind of a backbone of the story, which is a developmental story that is dominant over the general history that we would tell of Port of Spain. But it's a temporal tale, and a temporal tale is always limited. But space is very much more complicated, and so what Steve, having established what seems like a fairly conventional historical story, a place where the normal historian would breathe in, having spent an awful lot of time in archives and being really proud of himself to organize all these facts together, and now I'm using the male program, pronoun quite correctly, that uh, man would sigh and say, I've got my job done, but that's exactly where Steve begins. If you have that story, then we need to reach out and reach out in very interesting directions. In one direction of cultural extremity, we reach all the way out of the city of downtown Port of Spain, out to the edges, and in the edges where we find compounds where the Yoruba gods are being worshipped. Not in a kind of sense of resistance, but just because that's the religion of the people. Herskovitz was there in the 30s and saw the kind of thing that Pravita and I have done at 1,500 Candomblé Tejeros in the city of Salvador de Bahia. And we're used to these events, these events of where the gods come down and ride the people, and the people take the gods on, on a ride. And the people become the gods and change their costumes. And you feel the power, the unbelievable power. In other words, out there at the edge of Port of Spain, there's a kind of power going on that is every bit as great and every bit as strong as a kind of power that's political, that's downtown, sacred power. One of the extremes that Steve investigates is the cultural extreme of the old West African religion, still not tripling away, but powerfully alive. Another one is class extreme, and the class extreme is represented by the barrack yards. Barracks were long tenements of single rooms that were actually houses, houses that were 10 by 10 or 12 by 12, houses that were smaller than the slave quarters, houses that were more miserable than the slave quarters, long strings of these buildings. Exactly the same thing was found in New Orleans. The interior of the blocks in New Orleans, just like the interior of the blocks in Port of Spain, had these Barracks, these barracks where people lived in tiny little overcrowded places. Just like New Orleans, we found it in the favelas of Brazil. Same exact tenements. And one of those tenements in Provina found in, and I found in Brazil is 
artist called Flavio, one of our favorite of all and most creative of all artists, and that is exactly the whole point. This guy living in the tenement is a great artist. So here we've got, in the barrack yards, half of the population in the 1930s in Trinidad lived in those. Half the population lived in these situations that were no question places of misery and no question places of unbelievable creativity. In the middle, on the one hand, we've got this, the steady story of downtown activity where basically the government's in charge. And then out in the edges, you've got places where the government doesn't even know about, much less be in charge. And then in the middle, there's a kind of a messy territory of handmade, homemade houses. There are two different stories of connection. One of them is the story that if you read, uh, and I certainly recommend it, V.S. Naipaul's, one of the books that led him to the Nobel Prize. He was from Port of Spain. This is his hometown, Naipaul. One of the greatest writers of our time. Recently died. He wrote a book called A House for Mr. Bishwash, and that House for Mr. Bishwash narrative tells you about a man who starts in a traditional house and then aspires to America. It's the transformation of, of a person becoming American. At the end of it, he's got a little house just like all Americans have, and isn't that great? He started out in a terrible, complicated joint family operation, just like you have in India. So his movement was in the direction of downtown. Many other people in Port of Spain have clearly moved in the other direction. That is, not exactly in a sense of rebellion, but in a sense of not wanting to be dominated. They've chosen informal housing. They've chosen backcountry locations. They've chosen other places to be. It's hard for us to imagine, I suppose, a preference for something that looks like poverty to somebody else, but it may not look like poverty to me. It may look like home. And that's exactly the thing that seems to be a big part of the story. You can have Mr. Bishwash trying to become an American. And the May, at the same time, the whole lot of people who are already Americans have decided that I don't think we want to be pushed around by the government. So the government comes in, it's exactly like the situation in the United States. The government comes in with marvelous projects for housing the poor, all of which are based on a much consideration for the human body and no consideration for the human brain. And as a result of that domination that's represented by doing good, an awful lot of people have decided to live in shanty towns, decided to live it along the edges, have decided in Brazil to live in favelas, have decided in Turkey to live in the Gejikondos, have decided not to be dominated by somebody else, but to have a situation where we can make our own messes because it's ours. So on the ground of cultural geography, our, my pal Steve, has mapped all the dichotomies that are conventional to us. There's one of the things that's put this book is the history of Port of Spain, for sure, but what else it is, it's almost a demonstration of the qualities and problems that we have always faced in the kinds of studies that we do. That is, studies that are guided by space, studies that welcome the poor, studies that welcome continuity. So on the ground of cultural geography, Steve maps all the dichotomies we're used to. The colonial versus the creole. The cosmopolitan versus the parochial. The formal versus the informal. The progressive versus the continuous. The com comfortable versus the sociable. Popular culture, the creation of capitalism, versus folk culture, the creation out of human freedom. Steve's geographic orientation brings all these dichotomies into play, into a dynamic relationship. And what I think is also, has to be a compliment, through hard work and amazing detailed study, he's actually made you, if you read the book, which I have, want to go to Port of Spain. <laughs> Congratulations, Steve.